Welcome all to the first session of day two, leading towards a new equilibrium. We have global leaders on the panel today. To welcome our esteemed panelists and to moderate the session, let me invite Ambika Singh Khama. Ambika Singh Khama has been with NDTV's special projects for the last seven years. She has worked on campaigns for social causes across various genres and spearheaded campaigns like Banega Swatch India and Banega Swast India. She has been an integral part of campaigns on projects like Save Our Tigers, Defeating Diabetes, Road to Safety, Every Life Counts, and many more. In fact, Ambika started her career as a sports journalist, but her passion for environment made her switch from sports journalism to anchoring campaigns on social issues. I'm truly inspired by your passion, Ambika. Over to you to introduce the speakers and continue with the conference proceedings. Thank you, Thank you so much, Aparna. It's a pleasure being here. Uh, into the, you know, I would like to first of all introduce everybody. Hello and welcome to Talentonomics India's and CAS fifth annual virtual conference, leading with grit and grace. The focus of this session is to illustrate purpose, resilience, empathy, collaboration, the openness to actually learn something. The new leadership mantra. I would like to quote that the most powerful leadership tool you have is your own personal example. So let me introduce you to our esteemed panel, leaders from across the globe, those who have led and inspired many. Today, they will talk about their leadership journey, challenges, and beliefs. So we have Frances Valentin. She's the founder and CEO of the Mind Lab and Tech Futures Lab. She's from New Zealand. She's an educator and a technologist. Thank you, Frances, for joining us. We have Dr. Rubana Huck. She's a managing, uh, she's a president of the Bangladesh Garment Manufacturing Association, as well as she's the managing director of the Mohabbati Group, uh, you know, in Bangladesh. She's a grandmother. She's a leader in every aspect. And uh, then also we have T.N. Hari. He's the head of uh, HR Big Basket. He's an author. He's an angel investor. And we have Shweta Anand Arora. She's a leadership coach, founder, CEO, core question. And she is again, a young mother and a young leader. Thank you all for joining us. So let me start with you, uh, Ruba, uh, uh, sorry, Rubana, let me start with you. You're born and brought up in Bangladesh. You know, it's a very conservative environment. How challenging has it been for you to actually pursue your, your dreams and reach where you're today? Very tricky question because, you know, number one, thank you very much for having me here. Um, it's not just about Bangladesh. Bangladesh is not at all conservative. We're very secular. We're doing well. Um, it's, I think it's, it's the general mindset that stops female leadership from getting to the points that it ought to go. So I don't think it's about the country. It's about the general gender issue. Um, it's the same here. Uh, and yes, whether it's really hard for uh, women uh, who are striving to make it to the next level, uh, well, yes, it's, it's doubly hard because as women, we, most of us try and overprove ourselves. So that is, a, that is a challenge that we all have. And that's what's been um, basically, I mean, that kind of causes spondylitis, that causes fibromyalgia, that causes a lot of stress. So um, I think um, it's, it's a tough call to make uh, make it to the ceiling and to, as, as, it's, as it often is said that, you know, you break the glass ceiling. Do we actually break the glass ceiling and how does it look? Uh, it's tough. It's tough meaning uh, men don't make it any better for you and women make it harder. So, uh, you know, UN has a, I think UN Women has the slogan, he for she. So I always say it's she for she, because unless a woman is out there, to support you, it's it's not quite the case. Even in a garment factory setup, we have very few female supervisors because the woman in the line is not going to be in the production line is not going to support uh, the woman leader who's going to be uh, calling the shots. So it's a very complex situation that we have. So yes, it's very difficult for women to get through um, this phase. I am very lucky because. Um, my, my late husband kind of never thought uh, that I should be in the position that I am today in, maybe because he thought that it was still, it was a jungle of, you know, um, uh, uh, really male chauvinists. 
uh, at the end of it, I broke that and I became the president of Bangladesh Garment Manufacturers and Exporters Association, which is which leads the country literally because 84% of the export is RMG, ready-made garments. Uh, being up here hasn't been easy. Uh, I've taken in a lot of uh, beating for this. There's been a lot of criticism, but at the end, I think what got me through were my children, the support, uh, and what got me through was uh, was my uh, were my episodes, multiple episodes of, of struggle, strength, and grief. And, and I think I just learned to cope with the challenges through just being trying to being trying to being graceful. And that's it. That's kind of that's what got me through. Thank you. I think that's really inspiring, Rubana. Thanks for sharing. And we're going to be discussing a lot more on that. Francis, let me ask you, you live in a country, again, very different from where we are living or, you know, how Rubana shared. It's, New Zealand is a country which is led by, you know, a team of young women. Or in fact, at the present, a young woman, let me put it that way. You're a leader in the tech world. Tell us how does it, you know, what all does it take to actually lead, you know, to breaking new territories in this uh, aspect of life? Thank you very much. And it's lovely to be here. Um, first of all, I think New Zealand is in a very different position than most countries. One, we are a very young country. Uh, we were only colonized 180 years ago. So the, the treaty when, the, when it was first settled was such a short time ago. And so we are still very deeply influenced by indigenous culture, the Maori people who um, own the land and the country. And so, first of all, the, the commitment to New Zealand is not necessarily formed just from a European point of view or an English point of view, but actually very strongly from a cultural point of view. And the key um, value that they have is um, manakitanga. And manakitanga is this idea of extending love and compassion to all. And so we have a culture which is not divided by gender nearly as much as many other countries. So when you are stepping into areas like in my case, technology, you're not seen from, for your gender nearly as much as I've seen in other countries. And in fact, in my own organization, which is based around technology, the vast majority, more than 75% more than are female. And, and, uh, and so we don't have it. And it's partially because we haven't got this deep rooted customs, traditions and behaviors that have carried through many centuries. And so we are a little bit like the rudder of the new ship. So they actually, we are determining the new world. And I think the fact that uh, our prime minister, Jacinda Ardern has just been voted in again three weeks ago. And she is a remarkable young woman who got into the country as prime minister when she was just 38. She was pregnant when she first started and second term now at 40. She has really, um, is really symbolizing a change in the world, I think. And she is very much focused on bringing uh, connections and communities together and not this divisive individualistic view of the world, which is often a, a Western view. You know, I do feel that New Zealand has this great privilege of having the collective view, the, this idea of coming together as a community. And so it, it stands apart because people look to New Zealand, we speak English, we look like the rest of the world or the rest of the Western world, but fundamentally we're not. And I think it's, unless you're here, you don't see it. You, you just imagine it's the place where you get great products and, and dairy products and meat products and, and wine, but not necessarily what, what has actually shaped this country, which is actually a very recent history, but formed by over many thousands of years ago from you know, great warriors who traveled here by small, small boat and navigating by the stars. Um, so they were very ambitious and very courageous. And I think in the DNA, it's, it's quite a different country than perhaps what people imagine. It indeed is. And I think you're, you know, you're setting such high, I mean, it's looking at what you're telling us also. I mean, New Zealand is a country we all should learn from. I mean, at the levels you're up. Shweta, you are a high achiever. You've become a leader at a young age, like I had mentioned, and you took a break last year. Why did you take this break? And what did you really learn? Did it help you to reinvent yourself? Yeah, Mika, so I think um, when I took this break, I was actually probably doing some of the best work of my career. Uh, where I was working with BCG and we were doing this project with Niti Aayog and the government of Madhya Pradesh, working directly with Amitabh Kant and the principal secretary. And, you know, it was checking all the boxes and I was so excited about the work I was doing. And then 
I had, uh, I completely burnt out and, you know, my health didn't allow me to, to move forward and I had to take a break. Um, and in the beginning, it was really hard because, you know, I had been in education for many, many years. It was, it formed my identity, it was who I was. And in that break, I, I suddenly realized that maybe going forward, that's not what um, I want to do, but I didn't know what I do want to do. Um, and, uh, you know, there was a huge sense of loss initially. Um, but yes, I think uh, it was also a, a tremendous opportunity for reinvention, like you said, um, because it gave me the space to just reflect, to step back from the everyday, to really think about uh, my narrative so far and what was really, really meaningful to me, what gave me energy, and to then define the path forward um, from there and really um, not be bound by some of, um, you know, some of the self-limiting beliefs that can sometimes limit you. So, you know, I had all my life thought I can never be an entrepreneur. I don't have a single entrepreneurial bone in my body. And here I have my own firm and I mean, I, I couldn't be happier. So I think, um, yeah, it's really been, um, and I think it's, it's amazing because this year has in some sense, provided that opportunity for reflection and that little bit of space to a lot of people to just step back and really think about priorities and what's important. Um, yeah. I'm glad it really worked out so well. I'm sure it's so encouraging for the people who are hearing this. So Hari, coming to you, after all the women have spoken, spoken they've spoken about the, their journey. Yeah. Tell me, you know, you've always motivated women, you know, leaders in your team. You've helped them to grow as individuals. Uh, while women, like, you know, we've heard, Rubana, they've all said that they, uh, many women, we've seen it, have challenges. They face challenges at workplaces. Do you see a major difference in the challenges men and women face in leadership journeys? Do you see that yourself personally? Yes, I think very clearly, Ambika, I think there is a very clear uh, set of challenges that women face that uh, men don't. And, you know, women start off, you know, have access to education. They continue to have access to education. They enter, you know, the workforce but uh, begin to drop off um, as they progress uh, through the ladders of management. I think uh, the challenges are many. I could broadly classify them under three categories. The first is, you know, the home and family front. Somehow, historically, culturally, women have had to bear disproportionate responsibility for that. So I think maternity is immutable, but as long as women are forced to have, uh, you know, disproportionate responsibility for everything at home, I think for their careers to take off is not realistic. So I think in some ways that is the elephant in the room that needs to be addressed in a big way. And it's not very easy to address it because there are deep cultural factors, you know, many other factors that, that are involved. The second broad factor, I think, which is a big challenge for women in their careers is uh, the kind of stereotyping and biases uh, that they face, the primary bias and uh, stereotyping being that, you know, leadership is a man's job. And uh, I think there are so many of these biases and stereotypes that they, you know, play out very consciously and many times unconsciously. So you can't even recognize that a bias is playing out and it happens every day. And I think the last thing which uh, is, you know, goes against women is the fact that, you know, it's some kind of a vicious cycle, which is the things currently are so bad that unless you proactively do something, they only get worse. So vicious cycle is where, you know, when you don't proactively do something about a situation which is terrible, then that situation gets worse. So I think these are broadly the challenges and I think they begin to reflect in many subtle ways. Say, for example, you know, women don't have the time because they have responsibilities at home, you know, to go out and do the male bonding. So, you know, women are going back home to take care of the other stuff and the guys are going out, you know, to the pubs and bonding. I call that the male bonding. And I have personally, you know, been very much against this kind of male bonding and not encouraged this in any way. I said all the bonding that we do in our team should be universal, which is everybody should be able to participate in that. So I think uh, that all of these biases begin to play, all of these challenges begin to play in their journeys and they are big challenges, which men don't face. I really, I mean, you know, really hope more men would think like this, the way you're thinking. It'll help so many women go forward in their life, not only leadership, I think workplaces and every, you know, every way of life. Rubana, coming to you, you are the first ever lady president of the Bangladesh Garment Manufacturers and Exporters Association in the last 37 years. 
you know i'm recently i was reading an article you had spoken on leadership where you said a leader always need not speak but focus on goals how have you put this in your life oh okay so uh if you talk about leading the sector um i have focused otherwise i wouldn't be able to steer the sector with the covid challenges we've had a terrible time coping with the overnight cancellations the sector just went into faced a lot of turmoil there are 4.1 million workers in this industry therefore if we uh, did not succeed then uh, we would be doomed and their livelihoods would be at peril so um we had a lot of challenges for instance when we started opening our factories uh, that was a major decision and everybody turned around and said that's a wrong decision so that was a conscious choice that we made and we were able to turn the economy around had we not made that choice and i had to make that choice because uh, i was i am in the hot seat mm-hmm. so uh, there are many times when you also need to just keep quiet and and steer through a crisis and then you know break down um so my mother used to often say that don't ever break down when there's a storm you have to go past it you have to cross it and then you can do whatever you want to do so i think i'm still in that steering mode and uh, hopefully you know um when i have when i step down in about 4 4 months or so uh, i will be more reflective So I think it's incredibly important for a leader to be tolerant, patient, um and not speak as much as I do often. Uh and that is a that is a very big uh weakness that I have in my character, but I'm learning, I'm becoming a better listener now, but I think that's what's key. People want to feel that they're heard, but while you hear everything, it's also incredibly important for you to maintain your focus your vision and go forward and uh, incorporate all the others views and it it should not be my way or highway anyway mm-hmm. so we we all need to be in it together so uh, big learning in in that respect it has been for me thank you so rubana you you were talking about you know how you've learned and what you're trying to improve but tell me you know you are a woman chief in a in in the in a man's world let me put it that way in a men's club Oh, you know how, how can you tell our viewers or the you know the people who are listening today that how have you overcome this you've shared some of it can you tell us a little more briefly because see if you really look at it the typical mindset which we've been talking about right now is against female leadership you know it's a global issue okay so the one key word is uh strategy you have to be strategic i mean you there is no end to strategy here I mean if I have a I had a board which is 35 members and I'm I'm the only female in the board so 34 men and let me tell you these are all accomplished businessmen the top notch businessmen of the country who are in the board and it's difficult um uh, so I have difficulties even uh, in having a seamless board meeting because I'm expected to be uh very um I wouldn't say complicit but you know they expect that you know I would always uh sway with their tune which I don't so there is no way but to be tougher so go tougher on men that's one be very strategic so that they cannot bad mouth you it's very easy to bad mouth a woman it is very easy to say you know that woman uh you can literally i mean somebody actually in my sector told me the other day with the new elections coming up for the for the sector he said you know it's so easy to bring you down because you're a woman i mean listening to that from somebody who's highly placed it broke my heart and i said what do you mean he said well i can just somebody can just say whatever they want to say about you and bring you down and discredit you so for a woman you have to be oblivious to uh, all the all the whispers and all the uh, all that all that noise so you have to have your head clutter free you must focus on what you want to achieve there is no other way out and like i said you just cancel out the noise you yeah. do not pay any attention to all the uh, uh animosity and arrogance and aggression that's around you you just focus on being the the graceful woman that you are and you 
lead with grit and patience and courage and and strategy and just be strategic and and that should that should uh, win your case you need to be strategic in your own family life as well mm-hmm. uh, i mean i've had multiple occasions where i've literally had to uh, make sure that i strategically tell my husband who was very progressive and yet i literally had to tell him so this is the seminar that i'm going to and there'll be so many people i mean not that i was expected to say it but he expected that you know i would share with him yeah so uh, you know you just have to maneuver through very difficult um spaces uh, as long as you believe in yourself as long as you're forthright and committed and straight that'll get you through thank you thank you really well put and thank you for sharing you know those i think the leadership traits francis let me ask you what do you think are the leadership traits that need to completely change in this new era look i think the the biggest one for me is the ability to learn you know i think a lot of leaders have got to where they are because of things that were legacy skills they had and from another time when they were very competent and actually as the the business models change economic values change uh, the demographics of our teams and our and and our, and our organizations change we also have to be learners and i think it's a really hard thing for many leaders to say maybe i'm wrong maybe i actually need new inputs new insights new reference points and so i think that the ability to be really open to this idea of learning and showing the vulnerability that comes with not always knowing the answer is a as a key characteristic of a great leader and and i'm seeing more and more uh, particularly young leaders very comfortable in that space and even in very high pressure say a board meeting will say actually i don't know the answer to that but look it won't take long to find that out and let's regather once we know and i think that there is um an expectation now of that vulnerability of saying actually we're on this learning journey and then nothing is fixed and you know in 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 you know in every single day i think we we learn something new about ourselves but also about others around us and we have to understand that that's really critical the other one for me um around we we really need to focus is is this ability to be constantly thinking about the integrity and honesty that we share and and not just showing some of ourselves and bringing our full selves to work to our leadership roles and and actually becoming more human this this idea that we have families behind us we have troubles sometimes we have days where we're performing at our best and days where we're not and i think to be able to be truthful for those around us and and not this expectation that every day is a perfect day and i think it's particularly for female leaders and that that ability to sort of say look you know there's, there's other things are happening in my life today maybe it's children parents whatever it might be that it's it's distracting me and you know i'm not on my best game today and actually being okay with that and having others around you feel the same way um we have a a few years ago we implemented at work a concept of leave loudly so that if you had to go home to be with your children or watch their sport or pick them up from school don't just quietly walk out of the office and leave your handbag on the chair so it looked like you were still at work actually leave loudly be proud of the fact you had other things in your life and it changed everything because it meant that everybody was like hey i'm going i'm off to see my my kids soccer game i'm i'm going to the hairdresser because i have to work tonight because i have other things in my job but i need to have time and and actually it changed a lot of things around this ability to be really transparent about the rest of our lives not just the one we bring to the office interesting aspect but tell me now life has changed a lot it's actually become pre covid and post covid how important do you think you know it is to help people gain the skills to navigate the future of work you know people are going to be trying to reskill themselves so do you think actually you know steady stream of people you know they can actually a lot of stuff now can be replaced using technology so who was that question for francis for you sorry i was i'm sorry I'm <laughs> I, I should mention, yeah, because now with what with COVID, you know, a lot of things like now we're doing this webinar through technology, and a lot of people are trying to reinvent themselves. You know, so how, what do you think of that? Look, I think there's never been as much opportunity to to reskill. I mean, education has been completely democratized, 
and we have the ability to access new information so easily and even engage in global conversations like this one. I think it is, um, there is actually no reason not to. And given our life expectancy is increasing constantly, this idea of one career or maybe two careers in a, over a lifetime is actually being replaced by much more incremental changes and people shifting quite significantly from one career to a totally different pathway and looking at transferable skills. And I think that there are so many skills we can transfer with some upskilling. And I do believe that we are part of a generation of leaders that actually need to show that, it, that there is this ability to con constantly learn and develop and not just for the C-suite, the very best who go off and do their executive training, but actually this, you know, actually bringing that learning culture within an organization. And, and I think it's, again, it comes back to different cultural aspects as well around learning. Um, and, and I think if I use the COVID example, and actually it, 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 there's a little bit of discomfort me even saying this because you know, right now here in New Zealand, we don't have restrictions. And, and tonight is a fireworks night and I can hear fireworks going off around my neighborhood and families laughing and having barbecues around me. It's, you know, it's 10 o'clock at night. And so we don't have those restrictions because we learned from other, uh, other markets. We learned very quickly what the best science, the best responses, the best by the, so the time COVID came here, we'd learned a lot. And I think this is again, part of this idea. You have to learn from others. Um, and obviously it, it certainly helps being an island and it helps by having a very small population of just 5 million people. But, um, but it is the ability not to always create something new but to learn from others uh, particularly when other people are relying on you to get it right the first time so i think learning is the takeaway from here we really need to be learning at whatever age we are later try and pick up something thanks Thank Shreda, you. you know you have played leadership roles in the areas of uh, public private partnership advocacy content development and you're you know today coaching leaders connect with human potential tell me how important is it to build a deep emotional connect yeah, I think um, I think it's 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 very critical both at the personal level and at the organizational level. And I would say that um, you know this this deep connect really um, I think the fundamental piece there is connecting with one's own purpose and uh, one's own core values and and really coming from there and and being able to articulate that, being able to stay connected to that because I think. Um, you know, like Rubana shared, there are so many tough times in a leader's journey. Um, like Francis shared, you have to keep learning. And, and I think what can hold you steady, what can really anchor you is that sense of, um, you know, deep connection with your own purpose and, um, and, and knowing what, who you are and what you stand for. And I think this also uh, really does translate to the organizational level as well. So, uh, and again, I would say that, you know, one is the emotional connect and the other is the connect with purpose. I think uh, more and more today, even with the COVID crisis, I think leaders are realizing that being able to create something which is larger than, you know, just profit or just the financial metrics is essential for, uh, employees to feel engaged, for customers to uh, to stay loyal, and um, and it's not just uh, it's not just something which is nice to have. It's something that has a very direct financial implication. Um, you know, there's evidence which shows that it um, uh, companies that have a strong sense of purpose, a strong sense of connect with that outperform others in terms of growth, in terms of stock market performance, in terms of employee engagement. Um, so there are lots of statistics which show that. Um, and I've found more and more in my work with leaders that, you know, in terms of traits, everybody is different, but really to, to be the best leader that you can be, it's about connecting with, with who you really are at the core. And when you can do that, that's when you kind of, you know, really live out your best leadership. So Shweta, like I'd asked Francis also, you know, pre-COVID, during COVID, and again, post-COVID, as we've moved into this whole new world right now, right? Hundreds of professionals are on a lookout for a career change. How can one make it quicker and more successful? Yeah, and Francis spoke about the, the you know, the piece around constantly learning. I think um, what I've learned from my own experience and also working with others who are going through these transitions is, um, you know, it's not simple. It's not quick. 
but there are a few simplish steps that you can take to create the space and to make it happen. Um, I think uh, one of them, and, and I was inspired by Herminia Ibarra's work. Um, it's too good. Uh, she talks about, you know, crafting small experiments. So, you know, her, her big message is that you can't just think yourself into a new way of acting or a new career. You have to act yourself into a new way of thinking. And, uh, and so to do that, you need to try out different things, whether it's in the form of projects, in the form of on online courses, uh, in the form of you know, getting involved in functions that you haven't before. So really trying out those small experiments, I think is the start point for figuring out what might be a new uh, you know, reinvented career. I think the second is to speak with people who are really different, who uh, come from um, absolutely diverse backgrounds and uh, who you may not have spoken to ever before. And again, do it with a completely open mind without any expectation necessarily that will lead to something. But um, you know, that's the whole point of diversity, right? When you talk to people who are different, that's where new ideas emerge. That's where uh, exciting stuff can happen, which uh, is unexpected. And I think the third is, uh, you know, which connects back to what I was saying earlier, is really uh, maintaining that self-awareness about who you are and what drives you, what gives you energy, what your purpose is, what your values are, and, and holding that as, you know, central in the narrative that you build around creating a new career. Okay. Thanks, Shweta. Ari, let me come to you now. You know, we've spoken about, you've been associated with startups for 18 years. You've inspired many people. And, and while we've been talking about leadership traits, you know, India's had a traditional, I mean, traditional grocery shopping, going to the shop, but now COVID-19 has brought along also many challenges with this new setup. What have you really learned during uh, COVID? What were the challenges y'all y'all faced? So frankly, Ambika, you know, online grocery got a huge boost because of the COVID. It was a tailwind as a result of which we saw a spike in demand and we saw a growth in business. So we were actually impacted positively. But having said this, I think, I've seen a lot of uh, individuals, a lot of uh, you know, companies, industries uh, being decimated from very close quarters, you know, uh, people, you know, livelihoods being lost in a very big way. So I think uh, a couple of lessons I've learned, and that, that has not got to do anything specifically with COVID. I think it's more to do with how do you deal with uncertainty? How do you deal with difficult times? And COVID has put us collectively across the globe in difficult times, but all of us, you know, have faced difficult times uh, from time to time, you know, uh, without necessarily being part of a much bigger crisis. And many of us have uh, dealt with uh, these little crises that we faced in our life with resilience. And if you ask me, you know, loss of a loved one in a family is far bigger crisis than, you know, either to the financial crisis of 2008 or the pandemic. So I think all of us have dealt with crisis and therefore I will try to, you know, you know, this is an opportunity to rethink what are some of those uh, things that uh, are helpful in dealing with these situations. And I'll just talk about a few of them. But I think Francis, Rubana, and Shweta have wonderfully put together all these amazing leadership traits, you know, which are helpful in all times, universally applicable. And I may not have much to add, but nevertheless, let me try to do that. First thing I think is that you should develop good habits in good times. A bad time is the wrong time to be thinking about what should I be doing? What should I have done? Should I have been run my company more frugally? Should I have learned new skills as an individual? So I think these are things that one must think of when you are when you're going through good times. So companies have recklessly hired in bad times and when faced with a crisis are recklessly firing people. So think very logically, think uh, you know in a very balanced way, even during the good times. And when bad times hit you, it's much easier to deal with those if you have those good habits. The second one I learned is that, you know, it's more important to inspire people than manage people. I think a lot of the three of the other leaders on this set, I mean, have spoken about this, so I may not have to add a lot about that. And inspiration is also about by being vulnerable, as Francis said, you know, it's important to be vulnerable. As a leader, for example, if you can easily say, I don't know this, or I wish I had known this, oh, I just got to learn this or be able to take uh, feedback in a very balanced way, being able to speak your mind where it matters, demonstrating character, courage. I think uh, these are very important traits and these help inspire people. If you can inspire people around you, you don't have to really manage them. You don't have to review how they're doing. They will you know, do things on their own. The last thing I've always felt you know, is that 
a balance of uh, the feminine and masculine leadership traits are very essential. And uh, by feminine and masculine, I'm not really meaning women and men. I think many women can demonstrate masculine traits and many men can demonstrate feminine traits. So I think extreme masculine traits have been responsible for a lot of the crisis that we are seeing in this world today. Extreme greed, extreme ambition, inability to manage all of this. These are very, very alpha male you know, traits. So I think it's very important to create a caring attitude. And I think all leaders, whether men or women, should bring a combination of the two. It's important to be ambitious. It's important to be goal-oriented. It's important to have an achievement orientation, but it's also important to be caring. It's important to say, I don't have all the answers. Let's find those answers together. So I think uh, these, you know, a combination of these traits, in fact, can prevent a lot of these crises. You know, you go down history. There's so many stories, so many, you know, cases where leaders who demonstrated an ability to prevent a crisis rather than deal with a crisis once it surfaced, where those who demonstrated a combination of feminine and masculine traits. Look at Akbar the Great, who was the, you know, a king in India, and I contrast him with Aurangzeb. Akbar brought a very, very inclusive leadership style. You know, the communities that were part of his kingdom, you know, a very, very tolerant approach he took. Whereas Aurangzeb took a very different approach. Take the story of Ahilya by Holkar very unknown queen in central India. Unfortunately, in the world history is full of stories of conquerors. World history, we don't learn of the stories of these unknown leaders who held peace, you know, created peace for 25, 30 years without a crisis even erupting. The story of Ahilya by Holkar is such an amazing story. And once I read about it, I went and read more and more and more about it and found that there's so many leaders like that who we just don't know. So I think a combination of feminine and masculine traits eventually is uh, important for every leader. The last thing is, of course, character. I think, you know, we overvalue intellect a lot. I think character is far, far more than in, important than intellect. We can see that play out every day. You know, in, intelligent people don't make a difference in this world. It's people who can put their money where their mouth is, which is character, who make a difference in this world. That's broadly very well put. In fact, you know, just we're getting a lot of questions from the audience. And one thing, you know, Hari, what I was reading very interesting was with how your daughter inspires you. Can you tell us quickly a little bit about that? And then we'll go to the audience questions. Yeah. So I think I have been inspired largely by people around me, Ambika, people who are very ordinary people, people who I have worked with, people who I interact with every day. I don't really get inspired by people who are historic figures whom I don't know, whom I've never read about. I'm sure they must be great people but they don't come across as real. I think people around me come across as real and therefore some of their good traits, you know, are very, very inspiring and very, very real because they also have real flaws. And my daughter, I have learned many things from her. As a kid, you know, she had, uh, you know, she supported the underdog, she supported the underprivileged. She genuinely wanted to support the underprivileged and she always played fair, played by the rules, wanted to do the right things in life. So these small things, and she is extremely wise. So I, I'm still not wise enough, you know. I don't choose my words very carefully. I come across as a bit brusque and a bit blunt. But she chooses her words very carefully, yet makes a point. Very human, sensitive person who has amazing human values, appreciates great cinema. And you, you can make out a quality of a person by the quality of cinema and books they appreciate, the kind of characters they like. So I think I've been very, very inspired by her. So amazing to hear that you know your daughter's inspired and how you inspire women in their lives you know so we have a question we've got a lot of questions francis first question for you uh, you know from the audience when students interact with technology at the mind lab do you see any difference between male and female students uh strangely enough we so we are a graduate school but we we actually started <laughs> we're teaching young children a few years ago um and the difference in when with children, there is absolutely no difference up until about the age of 12. And, the, and almost the moment a girl turns 12 or 13 or hits puberty, suddenly there's a big difference. There is an expectation of gender and roles and also that technology becomes a, a much more male pursuit. And I think it's also just socializing a lot more boys spend time on computers yeah. and technology and games from that age group and girls are not so involved. And so we really um, have to, one, change a perception because what we discovered, particularly with young girls, it was the mothers that gave that perception. It wasn't their friends. It was actually, uh, they were talking about the girls could do it if it was something to do with graphic design, for example, or if it was something they perceived to be creative or writing or doing something fun. But as soon as it 
felt like it was more technical, more scientific, and maybe coding or robotics, it became very gender-based. So we had to spend a lot of time actually uh, speaking with mums about actually the, this perception that they were creating without necessarily intending to and some of the biases they were carrying from things they didn't really understand. I mean, most mums don't have a huge amount of knowledge and technology. It's more of a, a more recent industry. Uh, so I think, and then, then, then as you get older, I think you end up with more women who are much more uh, identify with technology because in the early days, for example, of word processing, it was deemed to be a technology and, and it was seen as more of a technical career and females were encouraged to go into technical careers. So women who are from the 50s, 60s and 70s are quite different again. But between, there is definitely an expectation of careers changed. Um, okay. okay, thanks, Francis. I hope that answers the question. Uh, Rubana, there's a question for you, which, uh, you know, they're garment sector, uh, you know, there are some unique challenges when it comes to working conditions and equal opportunities for women. What are some of the key steps you have taken to transform this sector under your leadership? That's for you, Rubana. Thanks. So uh, we have actually, um, we have taken a, a unique step of sending our workers to university. So there is a university, it's an international university, it's called Asian University for Women. And uh, that's in Chittagong. And the uh, chancellor is Sh Miss uh, Sherry Blair. And we have uh, at least um, kids from at least 15, 15 to 16 um, countries. Uh, and there, our, our, we call that program Pathways for Promise. And we have around 70 garment workers now currently enrolled in that university because one day I was going through the production lines and I thought, hey, um, if, my, my, if my career is not stopping at what I'm doing and if I'm still pursuing my PhD, at that point I hadn't done my PhD, I said, why can't a garment worker also do the same? Wow. So beyond the sewing lines, we started sending our workers to university. So there was a full on Harvard alum team that came and interviewed them. And obviously because there was such a huge break in studies, they were given the opportunity to have two years access course to the university. So they're now becoming graduates and four of them graduate on the 16th of December uh, and it's e-graduation. And that's the moment of pride for Bangladesh. And I'm very happy to say that the first student, um, I mean, one of the first graduates is from my own organization. So that was uh, something that I'm really, really proud about. So that's one. Also, we've started uh, incentivizing female employment and empowerment in the sector. So um, I started issuing um, rules that, you know, if you don't have one female member in the board of your company, you yeah. will not be given a contract. Wow. So, uh, so overnight, we saw a lot of women becoming, uh, joining the board. But then again, you know, just maybe titular chairman, maybe the husband was acting as the managing director and called the shots. <laughs> But she became the chairman. But anyway, I mean, it has yeah. to begin somewhere. Not a change. So yeah. far, yes. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, we can't change everything, but we, we do what we can do. Um, also, there are lots of, you know, every middle class house has a, has a designer. Every, every second house is a boutique, literally. So we are trying to link those, you know, boutique, uh, you know, fashion designers to export so that we can sell our line of heritage. So these are all isolated things, but I think what's, what's most important is of course, workers' health and education. And, and I'm a believer in, in uh, education. So I think that's the best shot that we can offer to our workers. Totally, I think education is the key, you know, for any, I mean, for anybody to go any country to grow coming on, you know, from education, Shweta, there's a very interesting question for you as well. Talking, you know, there's something asking you, having studied at different levels from top universities of India, as well as in the US, do you have specific suggestions on policy measures that need to be incorporated in Indian education system to initiate a change right from the beginning? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think um, for a long time, our country has actually been going backward rather than forward. Um, and while, uh, you know, we've created um, efforts like Skill India and things like that to fix things at the end. And, you know, when children come out, 
I think that's more like a band-aid approach because you haven't fixed the foundation and you haven't really, um, you know, created that base. Um, and so I think what we really need to do, and I think um, the new education policy has, you know, taken the right step in that direction is really fix the foundation. So focus on, you know, basic uh, literacy, numeracy in the early years, the first um, five years are very, very critical when a child starts school. And if you can build that base, they have the skills that they need to learn, you know, any other subject. Um, you know, they say that till grade three, you're basically learning to read. And after that, you're reading to learn. But if you haven't learned how to read, how do you do everything else? Uh, so I think that's, you know, fundamentally one of the policy uh, shifts that has already, you know, started happening, but of course needs to be implemented much more strongly. And, you know, as part of that is the focus on early childhood education, because so far, you know, uh, RTE only covered um, children from age six onwards, but um, it's really, I mean, all, all the research shows that 90% of brain development happens till you're five years old. So you were missing out on that. So really focusing on early childhood and making sure that children get the right inputs at that age, especially given that, you know, many of these children do not have those environments at home uh, to provide that input. Um, I think those are some of the most critical changes that we need um, in the way we approach education. It was really well put, Shweta. I think we really need to think about this, what you've put. Hari, there's a question for you. Uh, some organizations are more receptive to the idea of diversity than others. In your own words, while some celebrate diversity, others tolerate it for you know, tactical reasons. How do you initiate a reform for such organizations where the leadership team is masculine in thought process, even if they have you know, taken uh, women, even if, even if they're working with women? Yeah, very, very good question. So I think, you know, actually I've uh, put together a book that's going to get published sometime in April in, in the final process of writing it titled The Diversity Beyond Tokenism, Cutting Through the Clutter. So I think, you know, uh, diversity is uh, a topic where there have been a lot of politically correct positions taken by a lot of organizations. I think being politically correct is not the right thing. Everybody is you know, carefully chooses their words in terms of saying the right things, being on the right side. But I think it's important to discuss and debate issues in a more transparent way. Say, for example, even a subject like affirmative action, right? In a male-centric organization, how does it get viewed? The debate goes along. You know, affirmative action where you, you make a reservation. I think Rubana also talked of, you know, having a, someone, a woman on the board. Now, there will be people who will oppose that by saying that it creates the wrong kind of diversity. You get, you know, a woman who is a powerful man's husband, uh, uh, wife, and something like that. So I think, you know what, this is better. This is a good starting point, you know, to begin to create diversity. I think a lot of, um, you know, organizations uh, which are, you know, diverse in thought process. So we, and the visual indicators of diversity are gender, you know, race, color of skin, I think a lot of these come together if a company operates in a you know global setting. So, for example, if there is a company which is operating in countries like India, Costa Rica, Europe, US, automatically you're forced to recruit people who have you know diversity around all of these, which is ethnicity, around race, around skin color. You're forced to do it. So, companies which are forced to you know introduce diversity because of their diversity in operations geographically itself. I think they begin to learn usually. It is a very rare company which does not learn how to handle diversity when they're forced to do it. But I think the bigger question is how do countries that operate in one single location where these aspects are not as important, how do you get diversity of thought? So sometimes you can have you know, all male management team you know, recruiting women, encouraging women, but ultimately they make men out of these women. And that's not true diversity because true diversity is about having diversity in thought processes. And it's not just men and women again. It's how you think you need people who can be very creative. You need people who can come to conclusions very quickly. You need people who can you know, think through some issues, need some more time. You need to be tolerant with all kinds of people. I'm not saying you need to be tolerant of non-performers. You need to be tolerant of people who display poor integrity. Don't take it an extreme. But you need to be tolerant of all kinds of people who take the organization's goals and are wanting to do something good. So I think it's not very easy. Frankly, diversity of thought processes creating that is one of the most difficult aspects of diversity. It's easy to get women. It's easy to get, you know, 
a set of people who fit in ethnicity and all of that. But I think diversity of thought process is the most difficult one. Okay, so we have about 10 minutes and we have a lot of questions. So, Ramana, quickly, I'm going to ask you all each, you know, let's hope we can answer, all of you all can answer one question because I'm sure the audience wants to know. You know, can you throw some light on the strategies applicable to all areas of work that one needs to adapt as a woman in a male-dominated, you know, space with a couple of examples? Uh, the first strategy is, of course, uh, being focused. So patience. You have to be patient. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you have to do a deep dive. Uh, you cannot be surfing the, skimming the surface. You cannot be, you cannot be cribbing about um, uh, about inequality. So first of all, get going with what you have. Okay. Um, maximize on, on what you have. Optimize your entire potential. Do not uh, just you know, create a, a, a to-have list all the time. It's important for you to understand, look, this is as difficult as it's going to be. This is what I have, and I need to fight back with what I have. So you have to be a fighter. So be prepared to go out there and fight for okay. what you want. Otherwise, uh, it, it's impossible. You cannot step into the game and then say, hey, yeah. you know, but I don't, I'm not equipped enough. So that's not happening. So fight back and uh, optimize your, your uh, resources. Otherwise, you will not op be optimizing, optimizing your potential. Okay, point taken. Francis, for you, what are some of the policy me uh, measures uh, if anybody in New Zealand has to facilitate a right business environment for women entrepreneurs, are there any lessons uh, for other countries which we can learn from you? I think it comes back again to the, the, the makeup of our country. And I think that uh, we, in terms of diversity, in Auckland, where I am, the largest city, half the people who live there were born outside the country. So we have one of the most diverse cities in the world. And so in my team, you may have 20 people with 15 nationalities. That actually, that brings incredible diversity of background thought. Um, so it's, not, it's never about a gender diversity because that's easy to fix. Actually, when you have this almost natural diversity, and so we don't have to have diversity policies, for example, because it's naturally there. So we have some things which we've, uh, they're almost unfair gifts that the country has. And it's an unfair advantage that we have that we've got this diversity of people who have come to the country to live. So probably a harder one to kind of replicate in a country, particularly like India, of the size and population. Okay, great. Thanks. Shweta, many a times women get held up because of their own blocks and old patterns of behavior. Do you agree? What can women really do to open themselves to a new world of possibilities and believe that, you know, there is such, such a world exists? Yeah, absolutely. I think... Um... Uh, you know, uh, Frances, like she shared, that mothers were the ones who were responsible sometimes for uh, girls believing that uh, technology was not for them. I think that uh, some of these um, stories are so deeply held that, um, you know, we tend to hold ourselves back. And um, I think uh, Rubana shared some great strategies on that front. I think the first one is really to believe in yourself and to know that you deserve every bit of what you're dreaming uh, about. And um, yes, I mean, historically, what, what has got created is a disadvantage, but the fact is that the world needs you. And, um, you know, like Hari was talking about, the world needs leaders who are different, who are diverse, who really bring their uh, individuality to work. And I think as a woman, if you can just hold on to that and to know that, you know, nobody else is you. So nobody else can bring what you can bring to a particular situation. And um, and yeah, so hold on to that belief and, uh, and, and don't tell yourself stories that don't work for you. Absolutely, I think believing in oneself. I've got a lot of takeaway today from here. Hari, just the last question I think we can take today from the audience. You know, you've written in an article, why do you say that diversity starts with a change in mindset and not conducive infrastructure? I think you've written this and somebody from the audience is asking. Yes, yes. I, I vaguely remember having written this article in the Mint. So I think, you know, diversity is always about a mindset change. So I think uh, if the right mindset for diversity is not there, then I think uh, a lot of uh, you know, tokenism kind of actions get taken, which is that you try and meet certain 
you know, diversity numbers. But I think if you have the right kind of di di uh, mindset, then you would do all the right things. You would right, build the right kind of a culture. You would kind of build a very inclusive atmosphere. You would ensure that diversity really works and not just as you said, you know, right at the beginning, you were saying that some companies tolerate diversity, some companies celebrate diversity. And I think the difference between the two is that those that tolerate diversity are doing it for an external world. They're doing it to win prizes. They're doing it to come across as if they are great. But I think if you are celebrating diversity, I think you're doing it because you really believe it makes a lot of sense. And I can tell you that it's not very easy to realize that diversity makes a lot of sense. You know, a lot of articles by McKinsey research reports, they're utterly trash to my mind. For example, they try and prove using correlation that companies which have, you know, you know, high women in the board, percentage of women in the board or senior leadership to tend to produce better, better financial results. You go deeper into that and explore that, you can find that there's no real causation. So I think you don't even need these kind of studies to justify gender diversity. I think women form 50% of the world population. I think you're missing out on a huge amount of talent. You don't need these fake studies. You need to deeply, deeply believe that you know, it's important to tap into this talent pool. This talent pool is deep, actually very talented. I think those beliefs and mindsets are far more important than, you know, doing the right things, politically correct things, so to sound good to the external world. Thanks, uh, Hari, for sharing. You know, let me, before we wrap up, I think we've all learned so much, you know, today, at least I've learned from all of you, the great leaders that you all are. Let me quickly ask you all for your closing remarks. So let me start with you, Francis. I think it's, it's what I would say for closing is this has been a year where we've learned a lot about ourselves and our capability and our resilience to do things differently. And I think it's a really the time to give permission to each one of us to be much bolder and, and courageous and actually step forward with confidence that we can change some of the things that haven't no longer fit for purpose in our world and our careers. Okay, great. Uh, Rubana, what would your closing remarks be for today's session? I'll be a little outrageous. I'll just say that, you know, we women need to make uh, men uh, totally irrelevant. So Hari, apologies to you. Thanks. But the only way to beat, <laughs> beat uh, male supremacy is by making men irrelevant. Just be the best that you can and just, you know, beat uh, ticking uh, the, the, the female box with uh, hesitance. Every time I check in, uh, every time I go and, and, and fill up my immigration form, I'm very tempted to tick the mailbox. Um, I, and I do that every time. Um, but, you know, for the last one year and a half, uh, of course, COVID um, has not permitted me to travel anyway. But for at least one year, I've gracefully ticked the female box uh, without uh, fear or favor. So I think make men irrelevant because you have to be the best that you can and beat them in every every challenge, in every assignment, in everything that you do. Wonderful, yeah. Shweta, the... Yeah, I'm gonna just pick up from where Rubana left off in terms of really gracefully owning who you are. I think it's been um, a period of learning, a period of change uh, for all of us. Um, and so to really, um, know who you are, hold on to it and and own it, like live it um, and know that uh, everything else will follow. Okay, great. And Hari, coming to you. I think, yeah, you I think life, life would panel. be, yeah, life would be a delightful and breathtaking if you are happy with who you are, if you are happy in your skin, if you don't desperately try to seek endorsement or try to fit in. If you don't judge others and if you you know don't worry about others judging you, then I think your life would be delightful and great. Okay, great. I think it's everything is so wonderfully wrapped. I have a lot, I have learned a lot. Aparna, what would you like to say after hearing all you know these esteemed panelists today? I'm deeply touched, you know, with all the comments. Indeed, I think so. We all, all need to come together, not only in thoughts or words, but in action to lead towards the new equilibrium. As Rubana said, it's not only he for she, but also she for she. So thank you so much. Thanks a lot, everyone. Our esteemed panelists, Francis, Rubana, Hari, and Shweta. And special thanks to you, Ambika. You've been wonderful. 
for moderate moderating the session thank you all thank you all so much for joining us thank you bye bye thank you bye bye thank you so much well so who has sneaked in here now anish yes. is that you <laughs> hey aparna how are you what oh, a wonderful good. session what a what a wonderful what an impactful session, session. seriously impactful to the to the end and ambika has done such a fantastic yes, job thank you <laughs> thank you so okay, much ambika all the best for the next part guys thank, thank you thank you. thanks atan take care yeah i had to sneak in uh, aparna because uh, you know we've had a great participation yesterday we had about uh, you know through the day about 400 plus people on the platform today we are seeing about 200 plus people on the platform and uh, i know rubana did mention something on patience yes i made that note she spoke about patience but i am very impatient about the next session but that starting in 15 minutes uh, i wanted to take a quick minute to remind everyone remember the leaderboard aparna uh, yes. what do we have to do oh a laundry list of things but that will get them to the leaderboard right Correct. so they can do Uh, what they can do is attend like comment post share ask and answer <laughs> <laughs> that's true that's very true and then hashtag leading with uh, grit and grace is one of our uh, key hashtags for the cause conference and hashtag redefining leadership uh, that's something that you can use to post on social media platforms also we are running a contest where if you share your story of when you've led with grit and grace and anecdote about your own life share that with us uh, conference.talentomics@gmail.com i think i've said that so many times now i remember that email id better than i remember my own email id but uh, so that's something that you can definitely do uh, our next session will start in 14 minutes from now so that gives people i think enough time to do a few things one is uh, visit our uh, partner booths visit our uh, uh, look at the inspirational videos that are there uh you can take a brief minute to also sign up on the talentomics website to uh, for leslie williams masterclass on the 19th of november which is on leading with grit and grace i mean you can learn how to strengthen your inner balance explore your unique blend of grit and grace and understand the areas that you are being challenged while you are trying to you know achieve that blend of grit and grace so that's something that is happening on the 19th of november leslie williams is hosting that masterclass Uh, do sign up for it. There are only twenty-five seats on the master class, so that's something. Um, also, you can take this uh, now thirteen minutes before we start our next session. Uh, Apna, anything you want to sign off with? I would just say make most out of the opportunity which is available. That's See you cool. soon at three fifteen India time. See you three fifteen. So about thirteen minutes from now, you will click on the join now for the next session, and you will see one of us. I think me. I think Aparna, right? I'm. Yeah, I'm you going to, there for the most yeah. awaited session of the yes, day. I, 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 I'm, I'm impatient. I know <laughs> Rubana said be patient, but no, no, I'm very, very <laughs> impatient. So we have thirteen minutes, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the audience. So we'll see you in thirteen minutes. Thank you. See you then.